during the 15 years, we did the right thing and, you know, we took care of the people that we had to take care of and, and it worked out. Welcome to the Valve and Process Solutions Visionaries podcast, where we meet some of the most fascinating folk involved in the development and implementation of valves, actuators and other engineering solutions. In today's episode, we meet Frank Sinclair, who founded Westlock Controls. You'll learn about Frank's background before Westlock, how he launched and developed the business, achieving 35% annual compound growth consistently, how Westlock's early products were received, where some of the names came from, how the firm worked with customers to develop products which were genuinely ahead of their time, Frank's comments on selling Westlock to Tyco, and what he's been doing in business and for fun since then. It's a fascinating journey of business and engineering innovation driven by customers' needs. Enjoy this episode presented by VPS's Steve Pearson interviewing Frank Sinclair. So, hi, Frank. Um, thanks for joining us on the podcast today. If you could, um, you know, start off by uh, giving us a brief inf- introduction to yourself of who you are, and um, we'll take it from there. All right, Steve. Hi. Uh, my name is Frank Sinclair. I am the founder of uh, Westlock Controls. Uh, prior to that, I've been in the uh, valve industry for many, many years. I was a um, manufacturer's rep for 15 years prior to uh, founding Westlock, representing companies such as Durco and Worcester and Centerline and most of the uh, more popular valve companies in the United States. And we started to uh, notice that there was a long delivery time when it came to actuated valves. So basically, besides being a rep, our company started the first um, valve automation center in, in the United States, m- maybe in the world at that time. We actually named it the Valve Automation Center. The name VAC caught on, and that's basically how I got into the uh, business of valves and automation. And it's interesting you say that because we actually have a VAC center in our warehouse facility now, so we actually refer to it as a VAC center, but it's interesting. Yeah, everybody, yeah, everybody does. It's interesting. You're yeah, right. exactly. So, so that was sort of how you started. Um, obviously, yeah. you know, quite a lot of our listeners will, will know Westlock as a, a name, a brand, um, and a product. Um, could you maybe just give us a bit of insight as to sort of where it, where it all first started and, and how it came about? Yeah, as as usual, you know, these things most of the time start as as accidents. And as the famous saying goes, necessity is the um, mother of invention. We had received a large automated valve order from a a major pharmaceutical company. And the, the engineer called me up one day and he said, you know, Frank, thanks to you, I miss Christmas with my family. (laughs) <laughs> I, 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 I really didn't understand what he was talking about. I said, I, I, I don't know what you're telling me. He says, well, he says, because you sold me all these automated valves. They're, they're 20 feet up in the air, and we had to get this, the plant going. So I was stuck up on a ladder with my head between the pipe and the ceiling trying to figure out if these pneumatically actuated valves were open or closed. And it took us such a long time to do that that I wound up having to stay there over the Christmas vacation. And, uh, you know, with all the money you guys that we spent, can't you guys give us something like some kind of indication that I don't miss next Christmas? And that's basically where the idea came from. You know, we, we took a look at it. We started to realize, you know, he's right. If, if these valves, these automated valves are up in the air and nobody knows if these things are uh, are open or closed, So I started thinking about it, and after a few designs, we came up with uh, what we call the cup and a cup that changed colors, and that's what started the whole Westlock company. And and was that mainly yourself that did that? You you, you say we, is that kind of the royal we, as I like to put it? it? Was it basically yourself who came up with it, or did you have some input from other people? 
Well, I had a, um, I, I had this other company, and I did have a partner at the time. But I had the, I came up with the idea by myself, yeah. and then I ran it past other people at, at, at the rep, at the rep firm. We had one or two engineers, and then I worked with one of the engineers, and uh, we came up with this, I, I guess, clever idea of a cup inside a cup, and when the valve rotated 90 degrees then uh, the colors would change. So, yeah, there were a few people involved in the design. The idea was mine, but basically, yeah. you know, all, all these things are done by a, by a team effort. Yeah, and that's sort of where the iconic beacon really first started. It's, it's not really changed a great deal over sort of the years, has it, to be fair? Yeah, it... Uh, <laughs> we've probably over the years tried to change it, but it was one of those things that was just so simple. You know, it's sort of like Fender guitars and, and the first thing it's sort of difficult to make it, it, it easier or better when, when the first design is simple. So we just stuck with that for, for all and these was the, years. Was the, black, was the black and yellow color, was it, were those the colors you chose sort of straight from the offset? Cause obviously we've, we've kind of sold yes. that years as one of the features of the actual beacon itself and it was interesting just see what, you know did you kind of stumble across those colors or or did you make a conscious effort to uh to make the beacon black and yellow no, I, th I think the black and yellow came because um you, you know if it, back in those days if you looked at anything that was a sign of danger or an alert whatever the, the colors were black and yellow yeah. for for some reason so that that's why we chose the black and yellow an interesting story is that um we, we had that patented i really didn't ever understand what the patent was all about after i read it but i i, I guess he <laughs> i guess the patent authority did and we did have a patent infringement suit and interestingly enough we won that suit based upon the two colors which was black and yellow and the uh, the judge said that anyone else that wanted to make an indicator could not use the colors black and yellow. They had to actually use three colors, maybe red and green and black or something or white. So I was sort of surprised that with, with all the um, effort that we put into this patent, we win this patent suit based on black and yellow. I, th I think that's really interesting because obviously, yeah. you know, I think people are almost still adhering to that because, you know, from my point of view, we see a lot of switch boxes on the market now that have come out, and 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 like anything, most, um, you know, most things that come after the time of the original tend to be some sort of a copy, but nobody really seems to have adopted the black and yellow, you know, colours. They've they've gone as you say, they've gone with reds and greens and oranges and. Mm -hmm sorts of colors and so I, I don't know if that's still floating around in the uh, ether somewhere that people are still sort of you know seeing that that is you know um a, a beacon trait that it needs to be black and yellow so it's quite interesting that that's hung around for so so long yeah well it was sort of it was sort of disappointed for me because i thought you know hey i was so brilliant coming up with this <laughs> with this device and i win a patent because it's two colors something we never really thought about anyway so yeah, yeah, yeah. world strange and that originally then was just basically the beacon to fit directly onto sort of the pinion on the top of an actuator just literally to show open and closed yes and and you know like i said these stories all get very strange when we first came out with the beacon there were a lot of people that said oh it, it'll never work it, it'll be a failure and if you look back it, it was not a success. The, we we sold some beacons, but the problem was that the beacon took the output shaft of the actuator, which then prevented anybody from putting any accessories on top of that actuator. Right. So if there were switch boxes, then you could not use a beacon. Mm -hmm. So we were forced, not that we were so smart, but we were forced into making our own switch box Oh. With a shaft out the top, and and that's where the the switch box or the dual display monitor, as we called it at the time, came from. We really could not become a success just selling beacons. The other problem was, if if I remember correctly, that the beacon was selling for twenty four dollars, and there's not a lot of salesmen <laughs> that want to run want to run around the country selling twenty four dollar items, yeah. even a hundred of them. It, 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 didn't make a lot of sense. Yeah. So we were forced into 
coming up with something besides putting the beacon on the output shaft of, of the actuator. And that's, that's how the switch box came about. And, and just taking about that, was it, so there were some switch boxes, sort of early stages of switch box design around in those days. Yeah, there were, but there weren't any with an output shaft. Ah, right. You know, so the, so the the problem was that we couldn't say to someone, "Hey, buy X Y Z switch box and put our beacon on top of it." Yeah. At first, we thought of having linkages off of that um, the, the bottom of the switch box, but that really was a clunky design and didn't work. So. Uh, we were forced into designing our own switch box. And then when we looked at the switch boxes, there, there were inherent problems. The um, cams with the set screws that were always going out of adjustment. So we decided to come up with our touch set cams. Um, the fact that they had, some had uh, terminal points, some did not. And there were only six points. So where does the solenoid valve go? You know, it was sort of a, I'll get into it maybe a little later, but this this thing evolved as as we started to see the the existing problems in the industry or features that the customers would like. Yeah, so it, it sounds like you you know from your background you had a really good understanding of of what the customers like, and then you came up with the beacon, and it it kind of evolved from there into the switch box, and you were obviously looking around and and trying to make things better. And I think it's interesting that you touch on the touch set, touch set cams there again, because I always feel that's um, you know the stainless steel shaft and the touch set cams. I feel that is a real. Um, mm-hmm separates the Westlock product from the rest of the market. I know there's a lot of companies that have copied and caught up now, um, but just that not having any tool to set the cams for me when I first saw the product was just, you know, it, it, it was a bit of a light bulb moment. Um, and, and you think, you know, that could have been one of the things that kind of propelled you to the success that you had. Yeah, someone had said to us that we should patent it, but what most people didn't know was that Honeywell actually had manufactured a switch box that was not very popular, but we ran across it, and it had a design that was not like the touch set cam, but you didn't need any tools to set it. So the idea for the touch set cams actually came from a device that Honeywell had uh, on the market an unpopular device, and that's the reason that we really never patented the touch set cams. Because uh, Foreclaw says you just forgot. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you patented the beacon, and then you forgot to, uh, to do the touch set cams, and that's why everybody copied it. No, no. The Honeywell had had a design similar to it, and I was probably too lazy to you know find or figure out if Honeywell would say anything about it so we just we just left it alone i don't think we ever realized how popular it would be the touch set cams yeah and like i say it's it's one of the things you know when you open the box up and, and you see inside and, and you open other uh, you know products up it is one of the things i still feel that that separates it from the competition um, mm-hmm. and so you, you've got the beacon going you know you, you've got your your basic level switch box or two position monitor or, or however you call it how, how did things sort of develop from then onwards is that really when you sort of formed the company and you know decided to go for it yeah what had happened was um i sort of saw the potential and and i sold the rep company to my partner and then i went out on my own with um one other person and we just started traveling around the United States three weeks at a time in the car and have our clothes in the back. And we just went from every day we were in another state seeing another representative. The one of the advantages I had was that since I'd been in the business for so long and I had been a rep, I knew the good reps from the bad reps and I knew who I wanted. Yeah. And 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 most of them knew who I was because besides being a rep, I was selling all over the country, even to some of the reps, because I had the valve automation center. Yeah. So since we were automating valves and we could ship the same day, there were other representatives actually sending us bare valves and asking us to put actuators on them and send them back, you know, via overnight so that their customers could get the automated valves. Because if you wound up at that time going to the valve companies, the deliveries were running 15, 20 weeks wow. for, for an automated valve. Yeah. Be- not because you couldn't get the actuators. It was the, the problem of, 
of the linkages. The you had to make special. The yeah, the mounting. You had to make special mounting. So <laughs> everybody had valves. Everyone had actuators. And then it was a 15, 20 week wait because somebody had to couple one to the other. So kits were sort of made to order back then rather than, you know, companies churning them uh, out, you know, hundreds at a time. Ab- absolutely. And most of the reps didn't have machine shops. So they had to go to somebody, make a drawing and then have and, and wait for the machine shop to, uh, to get back to them with the uh, linkages or the and, mounting. And when you went and showed, you know, obviously the switch box, like you say, was, was, was starting to come around and then the beacon was, was it quite a, an interesting thing when you took it to show, you know, valve end users and they saw this, were they, were they quite taken by it? Yes. Everybody was actually the reps were quite taken um, by it. I was able to, start the company by every rep I saw. And and this is back in those days, every rep I saw gave us a seven to $10,000 stock order. (laughs) And I, I, yeah, that's a lot. I know. I agree. That's a lot. In fact, one of the actuator, (laughs) one of the actuator companies that was starting up at that time said to me, how are you getting these stock orders out of these people? We can't get these kinds of stock orders for, uh, for, for, Rack and pinion actuators. Yeah. And I, I think what it was, was as, as one of the reps said to me, you know, I go into a customer and I try to sell him valves and he says, okay, we, we know a lot of valve people. And then I try to sell him an actuated valve and he says, yeah, there's a lot of people selling actuated valves. He says, and then I show them the switch box with the beacon and I'm the only one that has it, and everyone gets interested all of a sudden. He says, actually, for us, the switch box was was pulling for us the orders for the valves and the actuators. Wow. So, yeah, so the the, the reps really jumped on, on the product because they had something unique. Yeah, and, and back then was, was kind of the infrastructure to, to kind of receive the inputs and outputs from the switch box in place, you know, or, or was, was that something that was being learned as they went along as well? You know, was it as simple as just like the open and close switching, you know, putting some lights on or, or were, they, were they in the sta- early stages of sort of the control loops and the control systems? Well, you know, as, as Napoleon said, better lucky than smart. What we didn't realize was that when we started the company, there was also the, uh, that was the beginning of distributed control systems. So probably when we were, when, when I was a rep and we were at the valve automation center, maybe we sold, you know, a thousand valves and out of a thousand valves, maybe 50 of those valves or 40 of those valves had switch boxes on them. But as distributed control came into play, they had to know back at, at the control room exactly what was going on. So we wound up gr- growing or let's just say riding on the wave of DCS. When we started the company, we said if we, if we could do a million dollars someday, we would be very lucky. And thanks to uh, the trend of distributed control systems, we took this thing all the way up to $30 million. So it was just the right time to to have that. Yeah, as I said, better, better lucky than smart. You know? <laughs> <laughs> we, we were. We've always said that, yeah. Um, just, just moving on then from that, it just, you know, one of the other things that, that I find quite fascinating is uh, some of the names of the products. You know, we've, we've talked about the beacon there and and you moved into the switch box, I think, you know, later mm-hmm. some of AccuTrack and Quantum and some of the other names. But I'm, I'm always interested with some of the great names like Silver Bullet and Magnum Switch and, uh, you know, Saturday night special and and one of the old sort of rumors I heard was this was your fascination with with guns and things like that is you named all these products so it'd be interesting to get your uh, your take on that yeah I uh, I'm not fascinated with guns even though (laughs) you know I, I, I do shoot like everybody else but there was no fascination what had happened was that we first came out with the uh with the magnum before the silver bullet and we had a um, we had just started the UK operation, and the manager in the UK said to us, "You know, you'll you'll never sell this this type of switch here in in Europe because <laughs> Europeans hate reed switches. They they don't have a a good reputation. So the product probably will sell in the United States, but it probably won't sell in 
in the UK or throughout the rest of Europe. So I said to myself, I said, well, if we can't sell reed switches, then we'll just have to sell a high current proximity sensor. And we wanted to give it the, a name that, you know, related to strength and reliability. And, you know, there's, there's the Magnum bullets. And then, of course, there's the Magnum champagne, which was, you know, larger than normal and yeah. maybe strong, stronger than normal. So that's where the Magnum name came from. We were trying to avoid reed switches. We never mentioned reed switches. We always said it was a high current proximity sensor because we knew the Europeans liked proximity sensors, unlike in the States where they were mostly mechanical uh, yeah. switches. So that that's how Magnum came about. And, and Silver Bullet came about because we, we were competing against uh, Go Switch, which is now Topworks. Yeah. And we wanted to differentiate that also. And we were taking pictures of the product and started looking at it and said, wow, it looks, because uh, it was stainless. I said, it almost looks like a bullet. And then, uh, of course, at that time, Pete Seeger and the Silver Bullet Band and the Lone Ranger and the Silver Bullet and whatever. So we just said, looks like a Silver Bullet. And that's what we named it. Excellent. Excellent. It's, it's good to just get the reality of where those names come from because there's so many stories behind them. And, and as that progressed, were, were, were you quite surprised then at how, how Westlock grew and, and how quickly, you know, things progressed from those early days? Yeah, I would have to say uh, definitely because, like I said before, we thought we would never be larger than, than a uh, million-dollar company. The company actually made money from the first month that, that it was in business because we were getting stock orders from the uh, from the representatives, and the company had a compound annual growth rate of an average compound annual growth rate of thirty five percent a a year. There was never a, a month or a year that basically that the uh, the company ever lost money. It just kept growing and growing. We kept looking at one another and saying. <laughs> 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 this is this has to end. You know, it's funny. Uh, other companies would come in and say, "So, what is your uh, plan for next year? What are your projections?" We would say, "We really don't have. <laughs> we never have. We don't have any projections. Our our idea was to sell product to as many people as we could for as much money as we could get, and that was basically the plan. And we we had great salesmen. You know." My, my, don't want to take anything away from those guys because they were they were super but we had great salespeople. we had innovative products and every year we grew and had a big christmas party and it just <laughs> kept going for 15 years that was it. Well, i think that's really testament to you, you mentioned something really early on in the interview that you know the reps bought into the product they actually believed in it and they you know they could see the quality of it and they could see the future for it and i think that must make a massive difference for people when they're actually out selling a product yeah, well, you know, for the first, I guess, five or six years of the company, there was there was no engineer. We we didn't have an engineer on staff. It was just a bunch of sales people. It was the company was probably ninety percent sales and ten percent, you know, the focus on on everything else. But um, we had gone into a meeting once, and and one of the company engineers stood up and said, listen, can I ask you guys something? You, you have such wonderful products and they're so innovative. How many engineers do you have on staff? And I said to him, I said, we, we don't have any engineers on staff. He says, what do you mean you don't have any engineers on staff? I said, well, we don't need any engineers. We have you. I said, we go to the customer, we see what, what they would like to have, and then we come back and and we make it. I said, so why do we need any engineers? And he looked at me and said, you know, you're absolutely right. You've got thousands of engineers out there working for you for free. I said, absolutely. And if we listen to them, then those are the products we make. I, I would say that every product, I, I, this is going to be a, a strange statement, but I'm not very sure, except for the beacon, <laughs> if we really ever came up with anything original on our own all of the ideas even though we made good products all of the ideas came from the customers by talking and listening to them yeah exactly and not only that then we came up with the 
criterion program, which at, at, at the end of, of the 15 years, there were thousands of customers on this criterion program where we would just go out and say to a customer, look, is there anything that you don't like about our product? Or is there anything you'd like us to change? And, you know, sometimes somebody would say something as simple as, yes, I'd like a special label just made for us so that we can, we can buy this, you know, globally and always get the same product. So we would give that a special part number. Yeah. And the engineer would specify that part number. And um, when, when the bid came out, we were the only ones with that part number. But we just had a book full of, of, of names of, of companies with, with special products that we made for them that really weren't that special. It might be I, I want a, a ninth terminal point on the strip instead of a, an eight. Yeah, and and that continues today. You know, we're still selling those uh, those Criterion spec boxes. You know, we see things coming through our office every day of the week from you know all parts of the world, be it Asia or, or you know Europe or anywhere. And you know, you can tie it right down to a customer. You can tie it down to the specification of the box, and it's mm-hmm. you know it's a really clever program that's really uh, stood the test of time. I think. Well, that that idea came from the uh, the fact that the professional baseball players don't use standard baseball bats. They have them made custom for themselves, you know, that they feel right for for them. So when we read the story about the baseball bats, we said, well, why not just do the same thing for the engineers and make special custom switch boxes? But that you know, that's a big thing for a company to do, rather than just churning out you know standard product and and trying mm-hmm. to sell it. To- customers to actually you know bespoke uh, make every individual one for every individual customer it's a big you know a big commitment but it seems like it paid off well not only that it, it made the customer feel like he was designing the product yeah. so you, you can imagine what happened all of a sudden here was a, 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 a one off you know a special kind of of switch box that was designed by the customer he was getting exactly what he wanted so naturally what would he specify except his own switch box yeah. so it worked as from a marketing point of view it really worked well for us Brilliant. And and do you, do you think that then once you kind of got the you know the the market with the switch boxes, did did that then give you the platform to start looking elsewhere? You know, you were always renowned for being sort of the market leaders and and four or five steps ahead of the competition. And you know that led us on to sort of see the development of uh, you know positioners like the iCot and then into sort of um, network solutions like Intellis and things like that. How, how did how did that come about within the company? Well, the Intellis idea, just quickly, because these stories can take a long time, (laughs) but quickly, the Intellis idea came about at at the inception of the company. I'd read an article where somebody was taking pressure sensors and taking hundreds of them and uh, and multiplexing them all together. And, you know, there was hundreds of these pressure sensors and they were all running on, on four wires, basically two for the center, two, two to initiate them and, you know, two for the power. And that really took 10 years to happen. This was just an article that I had read, not realizing that it really wasn't viable <laughs> at the time. So we, we played with that in TELUS, uh, idea um, for networking switch boxes for about 10 years. There was some company in the UK that was also doing the same thing. I, I forget their name, but they were not very successful at it. I think they maybe had one, one or two orders. It, it was, it was something that was, you know, b- before, before it's time, the positioner actually came about, because we had received a call from Dow Chemical that an engineer wanted to see us. And I, um, I went out to see him and he said, you know, you have this Hall effect sensor, this non-contact sensor. You know, if you could take this and, and, and put it into a box, we could use it on all of our control valves. Wow. And then, then we could see whether they were sticking or whether there were problems with the control valve. He said, we'd make a great feature if someone had that in a positioner. And he said, I've been asking companies for years to make something like this for Dow. And no one really ever responded 
Uh, and if you could do this, he said to me, he said, if you could do this, we would put them on every control valve in the world that Dow has. Well, you can imagine how many control valves <laughs> Dow has. So I said, I'll have you something in, in about a month. You know, he sort of looked at me strange. He said, if you can do this, you come back here. I'll bring you in the conference room. We have a huge conference room. I'll bring all the engineers in. So we did it in about a month. We, we made a prototype with the whole effect sensor. And um, I went back to see him and he ushered me into the conference room and then there was no one there. It was just, <laughs> <laughs> it was just he and I. And I, and I I couldn't figure out where the other people from from the world were, you know. But I didn't say anything, and I showed him, and he kept looking at it, kept looking at me, kept looking at it, kept looking at me, and he, I finally realized that he figured that we weren't going to be able to do this, so he was not going to embarrass himself wow. by bringing in, uh, yeah, a bunch of, bunch of other fellow engineers. And he said, I, I don't understand. He said, how could you do this so quickly? I've been asking people for years to do this. I said, well, you know, we're a small company and uh, we work pretty quickly and we've had the whole effect sensor for a year, um, for for years now. And um, that was it. We never received one order from, from Dow. <laughs> for, for the, never, never. <laughs> Dow, Dow never bought the icon. Oh, nice. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's that, that's usually how it works, you know. So Dow never bought it, but we used all of the ideas that he had come up with and the diagnostic capability, whatever else. And um, that's when, um, you know, we, we, we launched the product at an ISA show at that time. And we couldn't get the customers in the booth because our booth was inundated with Fisher engineers you know they all were right. trying to because because they were developing a smart position or also and so was Siemens at, at the same time and um long story short you know that that's what started it if you're talking about making mistakes about patenting or not patenting that device should have been patented the whole effect sensor the non-contact capability that we were able to um to get rid of all of the uh, the linkages, yeah. basically, and um, that we did not patent, and that, that I could probably right now, looking back, say it was a mistake. Th that whole thing was funny because there were specs that were coming out of um, just quickly. There were specs that were coming out of Germany that were requiring a standard mounting kit. You know, you had yeah. to meet the Muir and everything else. And because we didn't have a mounting kit, because it was non-contact, we were not able to quote those jobs. And we kept saying to them, look, this is a, a better product because there is no mounting kit. It's yeah. all done non-contact, but they didn't want to hear it. If And so what we had to do was when we went to Germany, we actually had to make a fake mounting kit with a linkage for the positioner so, so the that we were able to, it. yeah, yeah, we had to, we had to make it worse than it was so that we were able to quote, <laughs> you know, it's just a, it's the way the world works, I guess. So anyway. It's, it's interesting you talk about things like that because I was, I was going to say, you know, do you have any, is there any other kind of things like, you know, did you have any other regrets? Is the, is the things you wish you would have done, um, you know, throughout your time at Westlock? Cause, um, you know, I think quite a lot of the products you did were a bit ahead of the time as well in, in some instances, like you say there about the, you know, the non-contact Hall effect sensor. Is there, is there anything um, you put your finger on and yeah, what you really have done? You mean like having a regret like hiring Andrew Bokes? No, <laughs> you, you guys, you guys can clip that out. <laughs> no, that, was one of the, that, that was one of the best things we ever did, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you, you know what? I, I don't, this might sound strange, but I, I don't have any regrets. You know, if, if you, if you have a company with, with great people, our turnover rate at that company was maybe one, it was 150 people. And I think the turnover rate was like one employee a, uh, a year. And, and that employee usually left on good terms with a party for them because they were moving up to another company with, 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 with a bigger and, and, and better opportunities. But no, I don't, I don't have any regrets. They were wonderful people there. It was a great company. You grow at 35% a year. What, what, what is there to regret? 
Okay. You know, exactly. There's not more you can ask for than that, can you? No, absolutely so we, not. We sort, of, we sort of kind of fast forward a little bit then, and obviously, you know, you quite a lot of great years. You know, you'd expanded, you know, all over the world. Um, you know, you were you were probably the um, one of the most specced products on on any uh, vendor list that came out. Um, but obviously, then you you got to a point where you thought it was maybe time to kind of hand the reins over and you know let somebody else do something with the company how did how did that sort of come about well it came about strangely because there were a lot of people that wanted to buy the company and there, there was no interest actually in in selling the company at all you know everybody that came by honeywell's emerson's um bt you know british tire btr um we just said no we're we're basically not interested, but then as 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 usual, the more you say no, <laughs> the higher the higher the price goes. We weren't doing it for the price. No one there was really interested in in selling the company. Everyone was getting. I mean, our raises for our employees were annually ten percent a year. Mm-hmm. Every year there, there were ten, which was pretty good. Everybody was getting ten percent raises. There were bonuses, and. Um, like I say, there was there was no interest, and finally, you know, the price started getting the offers started getting so high that it was almost silly not to do it. And when when Tyco came by, they promised that they would keep all of the employees, and, and they stuck to that promise. They did. Yeah. They did not get rid of anyone. They they kept everyone. They said they would keep all of the representatives. They they did that also. They basically left the company alone. And they said, we're not going to fool with it. It seems to be, the model seems to be very successful. And um, that was it. I don't know if there was a lot of thought or anything put into it, but as long as the employees were okay and uh, the reps were okay, that was was it. it. And I thought maybe I'd go on and do, you know how you think, I'll go on and do bigger and better. (laughs) Best laid plans of mice and men. It's quite a hard act to follow the Westlock Act. Yes, it was. But, you know, you you think that, you know, I've done it once, you know, I can, I, I can do it again. And you don't realize that other things come into play, timing, great people. You know, it's not easy to build up a team of great people. Different markets have uh, different issues going on. But, uh, no, I have, I have no regrets. And I'm glad that Tycho did stick to uh, to what they had promised. That's excellent, and we're obviously we're we're a few uh, a few moves along the uh, chain from Tyco. There's been a you know a, a couple of other owners. Tyco sort of merged into Pentair, and you know we, we're mm-hmm. now we're actually in the Crane era now, where where Crane actually owned the company. I mean, you obviously right. you still keep one eye on the uh, you know on on what's going on. I would imagine with Westlock, and I, you know I don't really want to press you too much, but um, you know how how do you see things at the moment? Do you do you have a view on that, or is it just something you kind of look back with fond memories on no i don't i actually don't um i actually don't keep an eye on it um i, I think i don't keep an eye on it because first of all uh, you know who who would listen to me anyway um <laughs> out right if you think about it you know it's going to take the the advice of the old uh, of the old owner so I, I really don't watch it. And uh, what I do think about is that during the 15 years, we did the right thing and, you know, we took care of the people that we had to take care of and, and it worked out. I can't really be responsible for a company that, you know, I, I, I don't own anymore. And I'm not involved in, in the valve industry anymore. I'm basically involved in another industry. So I don't. I've been out for so many years, I probably wouldn't even have an idea of what to do there. But, uh, you know, I, I still, it's like your first child, you know, you love it and you hope it does well and you hope whoever owns it will do the right thing by everybody. Yeah, exactly. And and just you're touching on there, you know, so you have been away from it for quite a while. What, what sort of uh, keeps Frank busy these days? You know, you've got obviously new ventures with work and what sort of things keep you interested outside of work? Well, you know, uh, when you're a serial entrepreneur going from a rep company to a manufacturing company, I bought a uh, small flow meter company that at the time had been up for sale because I, I probably just panicked and 
and realize what what am I going to do now? I, I don't have a company. Actually, I don't even have a business card, which was <laughs> which was the which was the worst thing for me. You know, people said, "Can I have your card?" And I said, nah, I, "I don't have a card." So, in order for me to have a business card, I needed a company, and I bought a, a division, a small division of a major major company that manufactured flow meters. And uh, name name of the company is East Tech. And I left that company alone for a while because I decided to go. Uh, <laughs> this is what happens when somebody gives you too much money. I decided to uh, go to New Orleans and restore this historic mansion that was uh, antebellum mansion from the days of the Civil War. And that probably kept me occupied and uh, lowered my net worth considerably <laughs> for about five years. And then after a while, I just started looking at this flow meter company that I had bought. And as usual, when you look into anything, you know, you start to see shortcomings. There's always the next technology that, that the industry has not, you know, uh, put into play. And we started looking at that. And now we have a, um, we have a company that is making products for, uh, wastewater and um, faulty infrastructure, smart IOT, you know, everything else that's going on. And uh, the company is starting to uh, starting to do very well. So I'm basically in the um, business of um, finding fault within or faulty infrastructure within the wastewater uh, networks, underground piping. And that's keeping you out of trouble. More than actually <laughs> too much, you know. I, I I was I was hoping it would just stay small, but for some reason, you know. Again, you know, we'd spoken before about timing, and I get into this, and now everybody's into the IoT all of a sudden. You know, the Internet of Things, and they're trying to put sensors on <laughs> everything. I was at, at City the other day, and they have actually sensors uh, on their rodent traps. So wow. they know that if there's a rodent in there, it's time to go change the trap. It's very yeah. interesting. Yeah, the, the whole IoT concept is uh, is fascinating, and and it's changing how the business works because it was mostly engineers worrying about wastewater infrastructure, and now you have um, companies like um, like the telephone companies are are in the business because they want to have all the recurring revenue from the sensors that are being placed. I mean, how do you get the information out, right? Yeah. The information comes out cellular. So it, it's changing the entire playing field for engineering firms and for contractors and everything else when all of a sudden you're selling your product to the engineering firm. No, you're selling it to the phone company. And, you know, a guy like me says, what the heck does the phone company have to do with wastewater infrastructure? But uh, everybody's fighting for that um, recurring revenue that comes every month from cellular uh, connectivity and, and the IoT. But that but that's another story. So another story for another day. Another day. Well yes. I just want to say thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure to yeah. talk to you. As I, as I said to you at the start, I've been selling your products for well over 20 years. Um, and it's it's been great to uh, you know find out a bit more information about some of the things I've been told and heard over the years. Um, hopefully, you know, some of our listeners have got a nice insight into uh, where, was, where Westlot started and, and how it developed. So just want to say a huge thank you for that. And uh, well, thanks for joining thank us. you for the opportunity. Much Appreciate it. it. Cheers. Thank you. You've been listening to the Valve and Process Solutions Visionaries podcast. Today's episode featured a chat with Frank Sinclair, who founded, developed and grew Westlot Controls. And remember... Advice doesn't come in a box, it comes from Valve and Process Solutions. So if you want to challenge us to solve a problem, whether it's a single valve or an entire process, drop us a line, pick up at the phone or visit vandpsolutions.com. We deal with all inquiries and requests for advice on a case-by-case basis so you get the right solution for your application or project. If you've enjoyed this podcast, or if there's someone you think we should be interviewing, then let us know. Just drop us an email. Email kim at vandpsolutions.com.